Luke 15, let us go to that location in the Father's heart. And let's look at the scriptures too. But more importantly, let's go to that place in the Father's heart. Okay, just a few points I want to, uh, as I read, um, starting verse 11 through 17. <clears throat> um, and he said a certain man had two sons, and that we have been discussing uh, from several different angles, but um, the thing that we landed on the last couple of times was that the son, there's a difference between being called sons of God and God revealing his son in us. And both of those are in the scriptures and both of those are plainly actual real conditions. Um, but again, you can't have the son revealed in you unless you are a called son, meaning, and I'm, and I'm using that term now based on 1 John uh, three, um, beloved, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, called sons. And in a very real sense, we are just called sons until the son has begun to be formed in us. And that's what one of the things that we want to really talk about a little more now um, this, this session is the forming of that. Um, and um, Lindsay, you can write this one down, formed after the Father's view. <clears throat> okay, and then um, we notice that in verse 13, and not many days after the younger son gathered all and took his journey into a far country. Uh, so he gathered all this stuff you know, he gathered all this stuff, and um, and it was uh, things. It was objects. It was ministry, whatever you want to call it. It was something outside of him. Okay, something outside of him, and and this this search, this hunger we have to become something, to become, you know, uh, something important to God or um, to ourselves, to to feel like we've got. Um, some respect or something outside of ourselves. But when he did that, he left the Father. And he, and he had the things. And they were even God things. They were Father things. He had those. But he left the, the joining, if you will, the joining. He left off being a Levite. And he became just a member of Israel. Levite means joined ones. Uh, <clears throat> and that took him further. It takes you, you know, people go, okay, well, if, you, if it's going to be about memorial ministry, then we'll never do anything. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's right, because it's a waste. That's what everybody's going to call it. They're going to say, well, why this waste? We could be doing something with that. Um, you know, unknowing the whole time the disciples are saying that and going, you know, why this waste? We could have used this money for the poor and all this kind of stuff, not knowing there's one right there in their midst that, that claims to be with them and of one heart and everything else that's robbing out of taking money, stealing money, stealing Jesus' money or whatever, and not gonna, it's not going to go to the poor. And they're, you know, but we don't know that, see. We don't, we, go, we feel like if we knew everything, then we would make a different decision. But God didn't choose to, to give us omniscience, all-knowing. He chose to make us one with him. That was Jesus' prayer. His prayer in John 17 wasn't that they might become all-knowing even as we are all-knowing. First of all, I assume that's a total impossibility to ever happen. And second of all, that makes us rely on him, want him, need him, want to be with him, but not for omniscience or, or to get 
direction and information all the time, <clears throat> but to hear what is in his heart, what is in his heart. Because you can read the scriptures and you can read what Jesus said, and if you don't hear his heart, you can end up going out and, you know, killing others thinking you're doing God's service. Okay. Um, so he goes into a far country. That's where it leads him. And um, verse 14, and when he spent all, because that's that word all, when he packed up and gathered all together. Now he's lost all. Okay. Now he doesn't have the father or all. He's destitute. Uh, began, uh, first of all, it says he began to be in want, verse 14. Um, verse 16, at the end, no man gave unto him. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's house, my father's, have bread enough and to spare. My father." My father's, that which belongs to my father's, have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. All right, so um, I've, I've said this before, I firmly believe this, that we can have wrong motivations and still get to the Lord. Uh, first of all, that was one of the things I struggled with when I was in Bible school because I wanted Christ revealed in me. I wanted to know him. And I kept looking at my inward. I kept looking on the inside of me and I kept thinking, you know, I got to get right. You know, I got to get right. I got to get it together. I got to da 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 da. And then he'll reveal his son in me, <clears throat> which meant I had to become perfect before I could see the son who is my perfection. You know, I mean, that, that, that'll, you know, for those who think through that that much, others religiously just press on. Okay, I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to be more faithful. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm, you know, and truth is you're not. There is no, you know, that's a far country. That's a far country, and you're not going to reach the Father's heart that way. You know, the prodigal came back destitute, and yet the Father was still seeing more than a destitute, messed up son. He was seeing this looks like it's the time of life. This looks like it is an appointed time of the Father. This looks like this wrong motive has brought him back to the right place. Me and the right person, me, the Father. And here is where he will see my face concerning the son that is within him. You know, it says the, the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus. Well, the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus in the, is in the face of the Father because they're not emanating their own glory. They're emanating the glory of the other. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's how they work. It's, it's how they exist together. And it is their oneness. It is, that is their oneness. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so this is important uh, to realize that you're never going to be rewarded for being perfect you're going to be rewarded even if you're messed up as long as you, as long as he can get you. You see, see, I mean, in real life, the father causes the famines. In real life, it's crises that many times brings people to their knees. Can I get an amen on that? You know, people pray harder when they're in lack and want and hurting and all this kind of stuff. And and um, then within those, there are those who can catch a glimpse. They look into, you know, we say the face of God. They look into the Father's face and they see the Son. They look into the Spirit's heart 
and he reveals the son. They look into the son's heart and he sees the father. So it gets him back. It gets him back to the father's house. But more importantly than that, the first thing coming at that son isn't bread in his hands. And it's not, um, you know, it's not what we think. It's the father's face. Because in that face, he's going to, and in, in that reaction of that being, he's going to be blessed to start the change. He sees the son in me. When I have done nothing to bring out the son. Okay, the son's in you already. We're all born again, or at least I hope so. And if we all are born again, the son is already in us. The father sees the son not based on how good Adam is doing. What does that mean? That means that the prodigal went out and did all this stuff and, you know, maybe showed absolutely no sign of the son, but the father still knows the son is in there and is, sees the son and kisses him and sticks the ring on and does all of this stuff based on the son, not because he was called a son and in the family already and all of that kind of stuff. Because the, the reaction is a million times greater than the fact that he was a called son. He was already in the family. Um, as a matter of fact, probably most fathers would have been more harsh on that son because he was in the family. But less harsh because it's the son and he'd like the, the called son to see in the face of the father that he sees the son and that start the snowball rolling down the hill, gathering momentum, which it did in the story, which it did in the story. All right, so, all right. Well, that scenario and everything that I've just said is totally foreign to most Christians. It is totally foreign even, even to those who are seeking that Christ be revealed in them, foreign because they're still in the big middle of it and because they're, 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 they're betting on the called son, meaning being in the family and saved and, you know, um, to eventually kick in and please the Father. <laughs> to, 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 and that's what they're hoping for. And they keep wandering afar off. And um, so, you know, so it's an endless, it, it's, it's Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. They're in the family. They're brought out. They're saved from Egypt. They're blessed. They're experiencing miracles and everything. But they are not at the right place until a certain time of the Father. And so... So, so the son is experiencing the son that is in him, but based on the father's reactions, which we just call grace. We just say, well, that's the grace of God did that for me because I certainly didn't deserve it. Well, what if it was the, the father reacting to the son in you and giving and loving his son and and blessing his son, and we're taking all the credit thinking that, well, we're, we're you know, God graced me. He was merciful to me because I am a born son. I am a called son. I am in the family. And, and the father's going, please don't say I am anymore. You know? Don't say that because that's not you. Stop saying that. Um, and so um, this called son called the prodigal son he's, he is in 
this process of the time of life or the, the appointed time of the Father. He, he's stepped out of the regular, I'm just a son of God by new birth and God's my Father to a process that is going on that must take place and is meant to take place for every born again believer. Every one of us. Meant to. Okay. So from, from it's, it's so weird because it's almost like from that which is outside of us, we are, we are, we are seeing a reaction to us that is undeserved and um, and above the earth, <laughs> and above human nature, and certainly above the situation and the and the what the the prodigal son would call the crisis, what the father would call the homecoming of his son. This my son was dead. It was as if he didn't exist, and now he is alive. And this my called son, who was lost, is found in him, not having his own righteousness. And there's, so there's this, you know, you, the only way to fill in the gaps here is to like read Philippians or something and Colossians and all of that, because there is the full explanation of exactly what's going on. <clears throat> we get just tidbits in the prodigal son story, but when the spirit begins to open our eyes, then we're seeing more than a story of God the Father being the God of the second chance. <laughs> you know, because I messed up and now he's giving me a second chance. Well, it's, oh my God. I mean, if you'll listen to the things I'm saying, you'll find over and over and over again wrong views of the Father and of the situation and it's all wrong because it is constantly being applied to us because we say, well, at least it wasn't Adam. I'm a son of God. I mean, you know, that was Adam that he did that. But he's, he's banking on the fact that he's saved or whatever, son of God. Instead of banking on the father only sees his son and receives you in him. You are accepted, called son, in the beloved son. And until, you know, called son, until that concept becomes how you relate to me, you will always mess up and then just constantly come back and say, you know, forgive me, I've repented, I'm not worthy, but, you know, uh, Paul describes that in um, Romans 6, verse 1, 2, and 3 there. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Because he's coming out of Romans 5 where it's all, you're a called son, you're saved, you're da-da-da-da. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Even though you're saved? Even though it's by grace? Da-da-da-da? No, because he's trying to get... He's, tr he's trying to bring about a process where you will even die to your personal sonship and live by the son. I know, that sounds weird. But it's Christ in you that's the hope of glory, which is the son. And so that's, that's the father's, that's the task. And that's what I want to talk more about in our next session uh, to to break with our concepts that are so good and yet so pointed in the wrong direction, not to the Father, not to the Son most many times, but us, and that that's, that's our hope because at least we're saved and God is with us, you know. And I will say this, there's a greater truth than Emmanuel, God with us. When they said that, he was there and they were out here. God in us, the Son in us. Amen. Let's take a break and we'll come back.